So let's get into it. So I mentioned that I'm going to talk to you a bit about a mixed metaphor here, and I'm going to try to convince you that social listening is very similar to listening to music. Uh, so this webinar has kind of been long in the making, and you see that like I've been obsessed with music from my infancy. I started listening to uh, records on a uh, record player in my kitchen at home. I learned to read, reading along to stories on records, and this kind of history of music is a, a, of the late 20th century is kind of a history of my uh, development into understanding more about music and as a result more about marketing. So, uh, you know, as we progressed through the late 70s, my taste in music started to change. I was listening to eight tracks of uh, Grease and Blondie in my parents' car and then, you know, I got my first stereo, the Fisher Price cassette recorder and again my taste in music started to evolve a bit and I was listening predominantly to pop music. And uh, in the mid 80s, I went to my first concert at Madison Square Garden, it was Lionel Richie's Dancing on the Ceiling Tour. And it was really a spectacle, but it wasn't a spectacle of musicianship. It was more of a show, like a Broadway show. And what didn't blow me away was the music, it was the visuals that blew me away. And as kind of an unsophisticated listener of music and kind of a, a, a very young fan of pop music, it was really more about kind of the MTV spectacle that, that surrounds music. But then I started to get older and I started to take on music my own and as embarrassing as these pictures are, it sh shows you that, you know, I, I took up a little piano, I played in a marching band, on, I played the trombone, and as I learned to play music, my taste in music became a bit more sophisticated and it trended from pop to rock music. And as my taste in rock music progressed, it became more and more sophisticated over time. This is not sophisticated. When I was a junior in high school, I went to my first real rock concert, and uh, the opening band was Skid Row. The headliner was Aerosmith. It was the Love in the Elevator tour. I never really got to hear Aerosmith because the first note that Skid Row played made me deaf for two weeks. And this is when I first started to realize that there's a major difference between music and noise. As I got older and as my uh, kind of breadth of influences expanded, I started to listen to more types of music, different genres. And the level of sophistication that I then brought to the listening of this music started to change. And I started to realize that there's really more to music than meets the ear. It's not just about the song, but it's about the individual pieces that make up the song. Whether it's a, a, um, a live broadcast, a live show, or whether it's recorded music, there are individual pieces that make up this thing that we call music. And this is really similar to the world of marketing. And I'm going to try to sell you on this metaphor here, and I hope it works. So when I took on a career in marketing, I really looked at it as advertising at first, and I didn't understand the complexities of programs that go into building a fully integrated and um, powerful marketing machine. And as I got older and uh, you know into social media, I started to look more uh, at marketing as a type of jazz. So jazz musicians, they're always listening to what's making people connect to the music. Not only are they listening to each other and to what they are playing themselves individually, but they are also have a keen ear for what's making the audience react. And this is pretty much exactly what marketers do when they test and invest. So while jazz musicians might be made up of different types of instruments and personalities, so is your marketing program. So in jazz, you have very, very strict rules when it comes to song structure, whether it's cadence, tempo, or dynamics. All of these things only serve as a foundation for your marketing uh, program. This is where the creative improv element comes in. So while you have a foundation of what you do in search, demand gen, content, product, social, PR events, and all the other marketing channels, there's an area of improv that can lay on top of that. So jazz musicians, they listen during their solos to hear what's making people connect in 
much the same way that we as marketers test and invest. So it's all about going with what is resonating and breaking down those constituent parts of marketing disciplines. Each one becomes like a member of a band that needs to listen to others, communicate, work together to produce these kind of dynamic and electrifying results. Just like any sport, music has its own rules that you need to follow in order to avoid chaos. So music plays by these rules and it's a fine line between what we call music and what's noise. Without these rules, it's just cacophony. So cacophony and symphony are opposites. So one is about playing separately and the other is about playing in harmony. This sim prefix is all about togetherness. So if you've ever heard a high school marching band warming up and tuning, you can compare that to the tight, subtle, and intricate combinations of notes and rhythm in true music and hear that there's a difference. It might be, you know, the same instruments playing, one is playing by the rules and one is just playing random chaos. So the way that you need to think about this is that even the most rebellious anti-establishment rock stars that you idolized in your youth played by the rules of pitch, rhythm, key, dynamics, all of the rules of music. And these rules, like any rules, are made up of languages. So we will move on to the next slide here. So music is its own language and when you're first learning to read or to listen to music as an educated listener of music, you want to listen with a trained ear and the rules are relatively simple at first. Uh, each note equals a tone on the do re mi scale. The clef tells you whether it's high octave or low octave. The notation tells you if the note is flat, sharp, or natural. The time signature tells you two beats per measure and that a quarter note equals one beat and how softly or loudly to play. So when you look at these symbols, they might look like a different language to you. And then you have to take into account that music also works in other languages as well. So if you've ever looked at a piece of sheet music, you see a combination sometimes of Italian, Latin, French, English, sometimes German, Spanish, Polish, Portuguese. There's over 200 symbols and words that serve as signals to a musician, whether it's a simple signal or a complex signal. It's all about figuring out what these symbols mean. So when you're first learning to play music, you might start with something simple like this warm kitty song. And when you're looking at this piece of sheet music, you see there are really simple indications of what you're supposed to do. You have your notes on the scale, you have your time signature, you have your clef, the little P that you see circled just tells you to play softly, and that's all you need to know. So you can learn very simply as a student how to play simple music, but when you step up your game and you start looking at things on a grander scale and you're looking at things in higher complexity, you now have nine different instruments in this composer score and they're made up of different sounds and instrumental capabilities and they're all using a full range of musical vocabulary and symbology. So now we're starting to see all these new symbols in here. People who play music need to know how to read all of this much in the same way that marketers need to read all of the data that comes in from different channels. The crazy thing about this is that like Beethoven and composers, they hear all of this in their head but it's not just about the big picture to them. They're separating each individual instrument into its constituent parts to understand how those sounds cooperate to create symphony rather than cacophony. So I said I'm going to try to like make you believe in this metaphor and in much the same way that music has its own uh, symbology and language and character based format, data does the same thing. So you see, we have the symbols that you see on a day-to-day -day basis, even if you're not a coder, you see the hashtags, the at signs, the parentheses, the quotations. You know that these things work in search. Uh, if you start to build more complex code or you're building queries in Boolean, you start to see different characters, whether they're wild cards or the plus sign to let you know to uh, add an and to your search query. All of these things tell us many things. They're going to tell us what type of metadata is tagged in the photo. They're going to let us know what to include in our queries. They're going to drive the logic of what data we're going to be bringing into our listening platform. And they're going to indicate certain wildcards that make our queries cleaner. 
the thing that you have to realize about like data being in its own language, you have all of these symbols that are universal, but then you have languages that are not universal. So like here in the United States, we're accustomed to just dealing with a Latin character set. We at Synthesio have clients all over the world who need to read data in not just Latin, but Cyrillic and Arabic and in Asian character-based formats. On top of that, they want to know what emojis people are using, which is a graphical-based format, and they want to know what sentiment those emojis mean. So we've got to read all of these tags, all of this logic, all the Unicode that drives the languages. We've got to process it through our natural language and processing. Uh, we've got to reduce a tremendous amount of noise, which I'll get into in a minute, and then we have to add sentiment to all these symbols and languages. This is millions of symbols and characters that serve as si signals from simple to complex. So much like music, social listening has these languages and they have these rules, and without a structure and a complex combination of logic, human review, and machine learning, data would just be noise. So all data is noise, it's music without rules. What we at Synthesio do is provide structure to this noisy data. So when you look at this like progression, this is a kind of behind the scenes of like exactly what's getting pulled in here. You know, at its bare root, all data comes down to the binary ones and zeros that rolls up into code, which rolls up into quantitative data, which we could then scan and look at for qualitative data, which are like the individual mentions, pictures, and videos that people are posting. So with a series of disciplines, we can turn these ones and zeros into uh, data, which is actionable and insightful. So this is really about making that cacophony of noise into music. Now, one thing that uh, I want to get into before I get into our specific use cases is, is that most clients mistakenly believe that big data means more data, data and they want it all. But much like music, everything at once is really too much noise. It's really about the quality over the quantity. So what I'm going to talk to you today about is a lot of ways to improve the quality of the data you're reading. Some strategic examples of uh, different use cases and KPIs deployed uh, across uh, different initiatives so that you can see exactly what I mean by less data is sometimes more data. More data doesn't necessarily mean more insights and more value. Sometimes it just means an awful lot more work in the long term. So the first thing that we've got to do here is define the rules. Much as we define the rules in music with the series of symbols and languages, we're going to define the rules with a set of vocabulary, metrics, and use cases. So the, the vocabulary that we're going to be using today, queries, keywords, sources, authors, and influence, it's important to understand what each one is before we, we get into the, the heart of the presentation. So by queries, I mean that all of the data that we pull into our social listening platform is driven by queries, much like the data that comes up on Google search results is driven by search queries. So it's all about choosing the right keywords for the information you're looking for. So if you were on Google and you wanted to buy a pair of pink sneakers, you're going to search for pink sneakers. If you're within our platform, if you search for something like pink sneakers, you're going to get an awful lot of noise. And I'm going to talk to you a bit about how we could eliminate that noise later. So what you need to do with Boolean queries, which is how our platform works, is really build out a more complex combination of keywords so that you're refining the amount of information that's coming in. You're eliminating the stuff that's irrelevant. This you can also do through a series of sources and, and, and author uh, filtering. So by sourcing, I mean if you determine that uh, Twitter is just not a resonant channel for your audiences, you can choose to just shut Twitter off and pull in data only from Instagram and YouTube if that's where you find that your core audience is living. And as far as authors are concerned, you might find that you have brand detractors or people who are constantly spamming your brand's name. You could turn their accounts off so that you're not pulling their data into your dashboard and dirtying things up. This is like eliminating excess instruments that are going to cause noise to a band. So you might have like a, 
uh, three-piece jazz trio that's a bass, a guitar, and drums, and if all of a sudden you added a giant timpani drums and uh, 12 harmonica players, it's just not going to work. When we talk about influence, we're talking about what it is that drives certain social me media users to action. So whether it's the people that drive them to action or the content that drives them to action, we're talking about the things that resonate, that make them engage, that make them share. Metrics, these are not individual metrics that you see bucketed here. What these are are massive generalizations. So I'm going to get into the KPIs that we track in more detail in just a couple of slides, but at their core, the metrics that we're talking about in social listening and social intelligence are volume, time, emotion, potential, and value. So volume just means how much data is coming in, how many mentions, how many people are talking about your brand. Time means when did it happen, how often is it happening. Emotion means how are they feeling about what they're saying. Is it a positive emotion, a negative emotion, is it just neutral? Potential means how far are these mentions going? How far is your own brand messaging moving in, across the social graph? And then what kind of value are you getting as a result of not just your own content, but your earned content as well? When people are talking about your brand proactively, what is that worth to you in terms of uh, a media dollar metaphor? And then you've got use cases. So if you've been on our webinars in the past, you've probably seen an awful lot about brand health, campaign analysis, market research, and crisis management. At their core, brand health is about uh, you know, tracking customer satisfaction and how people feel about your brand and products. Campaign analysis might just be a small analysis of a digital marketing campaign you're running. It might be something as large as uh, you know, an Olympic sponsorship. When it comes to market research, I'm going to get into a bunch of detail about that later, but really what we're looking at here is how do we identify trends, how do we identify what people are talking about and get ahead of that in terms of what we're doing with our content, what we might be doing with our product development, what we might be doing with our ad serving. And then you've got crisis management, which is all about responding to negative things that are happening online. So when we put this whole band together, we get you know, this speaker system that's all about uh, refining, optimizing, enriching, filtering, and visualizing. We want to refine by choosing the right keywords that are going to complete these data queries that we're putting together. We want to optimize by choosing the right sources. We want to enrich by choosing the right data to reveal what our targeted audience segments are saying. We want to filter to find trends and opportunities within the data. And then, you know, last, it's all about visualization, which is what we're going to start with first. Uh, when we approach any client engagement, the most important question that we ask and the first question that, we're, that, that most of our account managers is going to ask is, what's the business problem that you want to solve with your social listening? And as I mentioned, we usually break these biz common business problems down into these four use case buckets that align with the common issues, questions, problems, and clients uh, that clients want answers for. So these use cases really form the skeleton of your strategy. They're the backbone, they're the spine of what's driving the initiatives that you are playing with within your social intelligence dashboard. This is kind of uh, akin to choosing a style of music to play in. So it might be like as simple as choosing I want to play a rock song, but when it comes down to you know investigating these questions that you need to get to the bottom of uh, for your business problems, it's more granular. So while we have these four primary buckets, you've got these sub buckets just like in music. So you might choose campaign analysis as your primary business objective, but there are intricacies within just as there are subgenres of musical classes, whether rock is broken down into hard rock or modern rock or grunge or metal. All of this can be defined as rock music, but all are really, really different. The same is true of campaign analysis. We're looking, are we looking to define success by volume, by sentiment, by reach, by ROI? Are we tracking that event sponsorship that uh, I was talking about before, a digital campaign, a product launch? You can see that we break each one of these uh, primary use cases down into these sub buckets, and this helps us 
to provide kind of that thoughtful analysis and insight identification that most of our clients come to us for. So once we choose the style of music that we're playing in, we need to start putting the band together. The first thing that we're going to do to put this band together is start with our rhythm. That rhythm is generated by our KPIs and our use cases and the visuals that we choose to display our data. So when you look at the drum set here, you can see that the use cases and KPIs create this backbone just as a drummer is going to define the structure and cadence of a song. So we've got our four use cases aligned uh, with our symbols and then we've got our five primary KPIs uh, lined up with our bass drum, our snare, and our three toms. And here's where our contest comes in. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to show you that there's a way to filter down uh, data in the same way that there is to filter down music so that you can not just spot kind of that diamond in the rough in the midst of all of that data, but also begin to understand the individual conversations and instrumentations that are making up that data. So the contest that we're going to run is this. I've broken up a very popular song that I would say 99% of the audience has probably heard many times in their lives into constituent parts. I've broken it up into the, a drum track, a guitar track, a piano and vocal track, and then the total full piece. I'm going to start with the drum track, and the contest is this. The first person who can guess what song I'm playing in the chat window within your GoToWebinar interface is going to win that Synthesio gift, gift bag. It'll be announced later on today on our Synthesio Twitter account. Uh, so uh, here we go. Here's the first uh, bit of music. This is the drum track, and it's around 28 seconds into the song. Each one of these tracks is going to be at the same point in the song, so see if you could figure it out. I'll play around 10 seconds. So pretty unspectacular, right? What you hear as uh, a listener out there sounds more like noise. To me, it sounds an awful lot like noise, too. I'm not a drummer. You know, there might have been a bunch of instrumentation in there that I wasn't just grabbing onto, but if you could guess what song it is from just that track, uh, I will be amazed. Now, the point of this is to show you that, like, we just listened to a constituent part of a song. It might have sounded totally uninteresting. But when you look at it in the context of the entire song, you begin to see how these bits and pieces of data, these bits and pieces of KPIs begin to make up a full-fledged picture that takes you from social listening to social intelligence. So I'm going to show you an example here. Um, and this is all about setting a rhythm for success with your KPIs and your use cases and your visuals. If we're looking at uh, an insurance brand, an insurance vertical, uh, let's say we're all state you're going to get a really complex combination of different business and marketing goals when you step into a social intelligence dashboard. You've got heavy advertising, you've got cutthroat competition, looming crises at all times in the insurance industry, and a mutating market. So it makes social listening really important for understanding what your target audiences are talking about, what's resonating with them, uh, and as well as it helps you find new customers. So splitting it up into three different use cases here, you could see that a brand like Allstate, they do a one major sponsorship in the U.S. Uh, during the year. It's for the NCAA tournament, March Madness. They do a March Mayhem campaign, which stars uh, one of their more popular television advertisement characters. If they're trying to track campaign analysis, they're going to want to look at awareness or reach, how far is their messaging traveling, and EMV, which is earned media value. So when people are going out of their way to talk about these commercials or this sponsorship, how much is that worth to them in uh, terms of like what they would be paying for paid media? And in terms of visuals, we could wrap this all up into a single kind of uh, widget-like interface where you can see not only the reach of your messaging, but how it's traveling across different channels and how it's improving on a week-to-week, month-to-month basis. Allstate might also have a desire to track brand health. They are a rather large insurance brand here in the U.S. They not only control uh, a whole bunch of local offices, but they also own e-surance, 
which is uh, an online insurance company, and they've got um, another sub-brand called Arity, which is a, kind of a technology branch of the insurance company. And then they also want to track all of these kind of cutthroat competitors that are trying to you know, outbid them, outbuy them in television advertising to get those eyeballs of the viewers that they want. When it comes down to brand health, then, we're talking a lot about share of voice and sentiment. So we're talking about volume and emotion here. What is your share in the market? Who's going out of their way to talk about you? And how does that compare to your competitors' brands? And how do they feel about you? And what can you learn about how they feel about you? The last use case for all state or the insurance vertical might just be market research. So rather than looking at really granular KPIs, we might look at uh, KPIs at a very high level in terms of just volume and time. So if Allstate wanted to find um, new local markets where uh, branch offices might be uh, smart to open up, then they might do a certain amount of analysis of conversation in certain geographic areas where they see gaps in their portfolio to determine what people are talking about when it comes to their product offerings and the product offerings of their competitors and where these places of new opportunities are. They can also use market research uh, in terms of volume and time to figure out what types of consumer offerings they might want to offer in the future. What's resonating with people? What do people hate about the competitors' plans that they can grab onto this high volume um, and topical information and shift their strategies as a result of their social intelligence? So the second piece of the band here is the piano. Uh, I'm not going to play the, the piano part of the musical track yet because it will just entirely give away the song. So when we're talking about the piano, I'm going to compare this to your queries and your keyword choices. So the white keys, the natural keys, those are your keywords. Those are the words you're looking for. The dark keys, the sharps and flats, those are your exclusions. These are the words that you want to leave out of your queries. And I'm going to get into a little bit of detail of why this is supremely important. The most important reason is that most brands have names that aren't made up words. They're not all Zappos out there. So when you deal with a, a common brand, you're going to have a word that's going to create an awful lot of noise when you're looking for that word within a complex set of data. So whether you're Amazon.com that has to contest with a river or uh, Delta, which also has to contest with a river, you're going to run into all sorts of problems. I mean, imagine uh, all states issues uh, with two very common words smushed together. I chose uh, the brand Converse. They make uh, athletic shoes predominantly. Uh, and you can see, if you look in the lower right-hand side, the amount of exclusions that you need to take into account when you're looking for people talking about the word converse. So there's a whole geometry and mathematics angle. There's the whole uh, concept of converse being the opposite of something. You have a converse statement, which is an oppos uh, oppositional statement. You have converse college here in the United States. In addition to all of these words that you want to leave out, you also have kind of words that you know are creating noise and junky mentions. So that's going to include words like sale, near me, return, stores, promo co code, deals. These are the types of words that spammers and um, consistent retweeters of just blind links use. So we're going to want to knock those out from the very beginning. The other thing to take in mind when you're looking at this big chart is that it's easy to get carried away when it comes to keywords. You want to remember that you're not looking for every single word that consumers might use when talking about your brand. You're looking for the words that have an impact on your goals. So when we look at Converse, they might want to look at their three primary brand terms, Converse, Nike, who owns Converse, and Chuck Taylor, which is the primary a sneaker brand that drives most of their success. Then you break that down into the product bases and you see an awful lot of other common words in there that are going to need more exclusion. So you don't want to be pulling in mentions of uh, all-stars from sporting events and you don't want to be pulling in mentions of thunderbolts from storms. So you've got to really be creative around what you're looking for. Then you've got the general words that people use when they're talking about your product, sneakers, shoes, high tops. The slang that people use, kicks, trainers, sneaks, tennies, chucks, 
the targets. What is it that pe you want to hear people talking about? You want to hear them talking about the price, the comfort, the style, the fashion. Do you want to know more about what people are saying about your famous designers that are creating shoes for you? Do you want to hear what people are saying about the materials, the colors, the sports that they play while wearing these shoes? Who are the consumers that are talking about these shoes? Sorry about that. So, uh, and then you have to need to take into account the last and kind of craziest thing here is that amongst all of this stuff, you've got 88 languages and whatever amount of competitors that you have in the marketplace. So while you're going through this exercise for yourself in Converse, if you're looking at the competitive set, then you need to start to think to yourself, well, they can't all be Adidas, which you know is not going to have as much exclusionary noise. But if you're looking at Vans, then you're going to have you know to use those exclusions. Even Nike is the name of a Greek goddess. So you've got to think kind of big picture here is that every large data set around a brand might need additional large data sets around it. So think really strategically about what it is that you want to listen for. Next we move on to the guitar. The guitar is going to help you develop optimized data sets with smart sourcing. So just as there's six strings on the guitar, I've broken down sourcing into six constituent parts. Those six constituent parts are sourcing by channel, author, geo, whitelist, blacklist, owned, earned, and influencers. One at a time here, channel I mentioned earlier is just determining whether or not you want to pull in all mentions from Twitter, Instagram, from major media news outlets, from uh, certain blogs or forums. When we're talking about authors, it could be inclusions or exclusions. You might not want to hear all of the mentions from a particular author who's generating too much conversation. You might want to hear more from a particular author who may not be mentioning your brand keywords, but you still want to source all of the things that they're saying into your dashboard. You can also uh, source smarter through geographic targeting, so determining which countries you want to look at, which individual states within the US or cities make the most sense to you. So eliminate all of those geographic locales that you don't need, that aren't important to you, and then you immediately refine your data set. There's then the concept of the whitelist blacklist. So what that means is that um, just like you can like add an author who uh, will, we can track every single one of the mentions that author makes despite the keywords that you use, you can create a list of specific forums, blogs, Twitter accounts, um, channels that you want your dashboard to pull in regardless of what keywords people use. In the same way, you can create a blacklist which just excludes all mentions from the site, even if they're using your keyword 100 times a day. So what this allows us to do is cut out those spammers and junk sites like I mentioned before, but it also allows us to refine the data over time when you start to look at the qualitative mentions that are driving the quantitative data, you might determine that a lot of the sites that you're tracking on a day-to-day -day basis are not even worthwhile and you can eliminate them from your data set. Then you've got the concept of owned and earned. Do you want to track kind of the response to the, the messaging that you're putting out as a brand or do you want to track the proactive uh, conversations that people are having about your brand keyword terms? And then you've got the concept of influencers. So influencers, excuse me for a second, influencers are going to be those people who are talking about your brand in the most resonant way. They're the ones who are driving conversations. They're the ones who are driving other people to talk about your brand, to share your content. So you could even refine your data pull by just listening to the people who matter most to your brand. Now, just as you can listen to the people who matter most to your brand, we can move on to the guitar section of our Name That Tune game. And you can see uh, much more heavily than the drums, the guitar might give you an indication of what song this is. And that's because the guitar provides melody. It provides that, uh, that catchy hook that gets you to whistle the tune. And this is much in the same way that the same uh, smart sourcing can provide you those hooks in your social intelligence dashboards. So take a listen here to 10 seconds of this.
I think some people might be able to guess it now. So when I say that we're talking about melody and the guitar, you have to realize that the guitar has six strings on it, and when you look at the neck of a guitar, like on this slide, you have an infinite really possible combination of notes that you could play at one time. When it comes to social listening, just like on the guitar, you don't want to play all those notes at once. It's just going to create noise. So if we look at a huge enterprise brand like Unilever, they have over 100 brands under their umbrella. Each one of these brands, let's say, has an average of 25 products. Each one of those products has an average of four competitors. Then you start to add in all of the social channels around each one of those competitors and products and all of the social channels in additional languages and countries that exist and then all the customer service channels. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and then you have that 100,000 plus of miscellaneous that I mentioned before which is just all of the channels creating kind of this noise around your brand whether that is through uh, local sources, paid influencers, incentivized influencers, mainstream press, blog relationships, sponsored forums. There's all of this stuff that could be influencing your data set and kind of causing a skew in the perspective that you're taking on it. So what you want to do is eliminate anything that could create noise and refine based on uh, what it is you need. So if you're an enterprise brand, you need to realize your limitations. You can't track it all. You need to make sure that the sources that you're pulling from align with what you actually need out of your data, the questions that you need answers. You need to understand that tracking everything is not scalable and it, it's barely realistic. Um, the next instrument we'll talk about is the bass. The bass is four strings. It's the low end. It's what uh, enriches music just as enriched data can be used to segment audiences. Uh, this enriched tune, the, the sound that comes out of a bass, is adding uh, a depth and a dimension to what you're looking at in your qualitative and quantitative data so that you can begin to get a uh, more microscopic point of view of who it is that's talking about your brand. So when it comes to enriched data, we're talking about four primary buckets. Uh, demographics, which is, you know, your standard gender, age, uh, you know, uh, family status, location, where do you live, where are you posting from, where do you have set on your profile as your kind of home base. You have sentiment, which is how do people feel, and then you have an interaction history. And this is enriched primarily because if you can track a long-term history of people interacting with your brand and having influence as a result of that interaction, that really enriches the way that you can look at the data because you can begin to capture these influencer panels of people who are having resonant conversations around your brand's keywords. So it's all about connecting with your core user base when it comes to enriching data. And these are a whole bunch of different ways that we could filter and break down uh, the mentions, the specific things that people are saying as they come into our dashboards. So we could break down by interest or affinity, age, family status, gender, marital status, so on and so forth. I don't need to read them all. But what's important to realize here is that when you start to look at each one of these tiny little filtered buckets from demographic, sentiment, location, and interaction history, you can begin to see a clearer picture of who your audience is. So if you are, let's say, the travel industry, uh, travel and tourism, and you have a hotel in the Caribbean and you're looking to attract males between the ages 25 and 34 who are into water sports, they're single, they live in Boston, um, and they're heavily active on Instagram and Twitter. Well, you'd be surprised at the amount of people that would fall into this bucket and you'd be pleasantly surprised because now you could hit them with strategic communications and advertising to try to get them to come to your hotel. If you're a different marketer working for a different property, you might be looking for uh, women with children who are into nature and wildlife and who have positive things to say about the environment in France, the UK, Italy, and Germany who are heavy influencers on Instagram, YouTube, and Pinterest because they post tons of photos of their family vacations. Well, that might end up being a low end. You might think that you had a core demographic here that you would be able to target and then you start to pull in data into your dashboard and you realize there's not as many people out there talking about these things as I thought. 
So there's a real big test and invest in element here in terms of figuring out um, exactly what you need to do with your content uh, based on the audiences that are already talking about your brand. So this is going to allow you to stop cold calls and mass communications, start segmenting these social audiences into clusters of consumers, and then beginning to understand why it makes sense for your property, your destination as a travel and tourism vertical uh, client, you're going to be able to make sense of exactly which audiences are where, what they're talking about, and what resonates with them so that you can really start to hit them with that targeted content. The last and final piece before we get to the completion of the song is uh, all about filtering. So filtering, what you're looking at here is kind of an old school graphic equalizer. And filtering is all about uh, finding trends amongst a huge amount of data. And there's a whole bunch of different ways that we could filter, whether it's through media type, channel, author, through keyword, through influence, through post type, through language. The real core here is finding that vocal trend, making your voice resonate amongst a whole uh, host of other things that are creating noise. So I'll play you the final piece of the song right now. It's around 15 seconds and you should be able to pick it up uh, pretty instantaneously. I hope somebody uh, won. But now I will complete the metaphor. And bad mistakes. I've made a few. I've had my shoes and kicked in my bed. But I can't prove. So now we've completed the song and we started with the drum beat, we added the guitar, then we added the vocals and piano at the end. And you can see that each individual constituent part on its own, uh, each gets a little bit more interesting and more spectacular, but when you add all of them together, as I will at the end of the broadcast, you get the song that you've heard a thousand times on the radio that you can't help singing along to. And that's really what it comes down to when we're talking about uh, social insights and trend detection. So you want to know what you don't know and that's a really difficult thing because what we talked about up until this point is refining your queries, making sure that you're pulling in from the right sources. Well, if you already know the answers to those questions, then you know, you might be able to get ahead of trends. But in the case of like a brand like Amazon, there's just way too many keywords for a brand like this to track realistically um, and uh, just way too many dashboards that they would need to build in order to refine their data sets to a certain point where they could begin to make individual uh, data insights. So the, the recommendation here is, is that what a company like Amazon is looking for at the holiday season is to find that long-term success when it comes to, let's say, toy sales. So they know that brands like Star Wars, Marvel, and DC Comics are going to continue to drive revenue. They can continue to stock up their supply chain with these items because they know people are going to buy them. Then, you know, they have a certain amount of, you can count on this as short-term successes. So in the past, you know, Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings, recognizable brands that might have dr driven a certain amount of uh, licensed good revenue. And then, you know, you make bad gambles. You count on a brand like Disney and Lone Ranger and Prince of Persia come out and you end up with excess inventory. So how do you avoid these bad gambles, predict the long-term successes, and really make smarter decisions about the short-term goals? So the way that I suggest you do this is building a huge dashboard and tracking pop culture uh, terminology across the board. This is where your filters come in. So at the start of the year, let's say you have a list of all of the movies and television shows uh, and toy product releases from uh, the Toy Fair in Manhattan in February, and you put them all into a giant dashboard and you're not concerned with individual mentions or qualitative data. What you're concerned with is volume over time. What are people talking about? Who's talking about particular things? Are they talking about Shopkins? Are they talking about um, you know, My Little Pony, are they talking about Lego, are they talking about Zootopia, are they still talking about Frozen? So one of these things that you could do as, an, as Amazon is start to get ahead of your Christmas supply chain 
by determining what's creating the most buzz amongst these important categories, even if the most buzz is a happy looking corgi jumping out of a funnel. What you're looking for is the next big thing, and you can find the next big thing by drilling into media type to find your core audience and where they live, the author, basically the influence behind the person who's talking an awful lot about a brand. You're a marketer, you know that people unwrapping products on YouTube has become a huge thing. So who's doing this and who's driving these conversations? What keywords are people using that are outside of your query data set? You can start to look for those with a, a keyword search within your data set. And then what type of posts are people making? Are they just sharing things or are they proactively going out of their way to talk about that new Lego set that coincides with the latest movie release? So these are really important things when it comes to supply chain and also to marketing and communications. You know what people are talking about before they're talking about it. You change the homepage banner on your website to reflect that your marketing and communications, your targeted ads on Facebook are all indicative of what you've been hearing within social intelligence. So like I said, musicianship, marketing, they're both about listening and communication. At the beginning I mentioned the best jazz music and musicians are the best listeners. It's all about picking up a groove just like it's all about identifying trends. So you want to see what that diamond in the rough is, what's resonating over time, what's spiking over a short time, you're looking for something that stands out as exceptional within the data. And the best way to do that is with a clean data set. So what you need to think about is that social listening and the process that you go through to go from social listening to social intelligence, it's not a funnel. The funnel is probably the most overused PowerPoint graphic in the entire world. I turned it upside down and and right side up and made it into kind of a upside down cake machine. And what you're looking at here is data, music, noise coming into the top and coming out the bottom as trends, insights, and opportunities. The only way that you can make this happen as you do in marketing and music is by adding these rules. How do you visualize or what's the time signature? What types of words are you looking for? How deep is uh, you know, what is the depth that you're adding to the music with the low end? What source are you looking for? Who's providing the melody? What segments are you looking for? Who's providing the harmony? So it's a very big step to look at these things as individual pieces and then grab them together and look at them as like getting the band back together. So we have reached the question and answer segment of our broadcast. Uh, I'm going to open up the chat panel here and grab a couple of questions. Um, let's see, uh, okay, Simon P wants to know what are the KPIs for crisis management, how do I stay ahead of negative trends so they don't have such a large potential impact? Um, Simon P, so the key KPIs for crisis management are going to be different depending upon who the client is. I can tell you from the start that um, most crisis management programs that we run are really heavily uh, and strategically involved with alerting. So what that means is choosing thresholds for, let's say, volume or sentiment. Uh, you know, you benchmark what your standard average volume is on a day-to-day -day basis or your standard sentiment percentages are on a day-to-day -day basis. If it drops well below that average or above that average, then we have an automated alert system that will send something out, communications, so that it's basically triggering proactively that you might have a crisis on the horizon. So um, when it comes down to crisis management, I like to think about it more as a threshold thing than a KPI thing and defining exactly what you think those levels are. Um, let's look at uh, one more question here before we log off. Um, Uh, let's say Ted L wants to know what are some of the use cases for social audience segmentation? What actions do I take once my audience is segmented? Um, I mean, I could talk about this for an hour, Ted L, but basically, um, very briefly, the use cases for social audience segmentation, my favorite one is content distribution. You know, you have a lot of um, brands buying into automated content distribution. I don't believe in it so much as, I, as I've 
really believe in social audience segmentation. So this is finding out what people are talking about proactively, segmenting those audiences into particular buckets, and then delivering content, specific content to those buckets so that it resonates with them. Um, and you do this by basically saying, who is my core audience? If you're, uh, let's say, Rolling Stone magazine to go along with the theme of the presentation, you might say my core audience is in the uh, 18 to 25 demographic of uh, you know, white males in the US, uh, Northeast and uh, West Coast. So now what you can begin to do is segment the audiences within those locations based on other specific demographic cr criteria, like what are they interested in, or uh, what is their family status. Uh, when it comes down to affinities, I think that's the most powerful thing. So if you know that your target audience is into, like I said, water sports before, you can target your messaging directly to that person and that audience segment based on that previous knowledge that you got out of social intelligence. So um, that's all we've got time for today. I'm losing my voice, um, and I hope you all enjoyed the broadcast. Uh, once again, check out Synthesio uh, on our Twitter, Twitter account to find out who won today's contest. So I uh, hope you all have a great afternoon, and that's it for us. Bye-bye.